you very much for having me here. Um, it's really good to come over and start to talk about what the Police and Crime Commissioner model is. Um, but it's quite interesting, only two years in, that the country's already re sort of debating um, whether police and crime commissioners should exist. And we have a general election next year, which may well abolish them. So um, <laughs> what I explained to you today may not be the case in, in probably a year's time. Um, so if I first of all, I think, explain what the Police and Crime Commission model is, um, and then a little bit about our agenda, because we're only one area of 43. Um, and then I'll start to talk about why we created the Institute for Public Safety, Crime and Justice, which from now on I'm just going to call the Institute, um, you know, for, for reasons. Um, and then I'll start to talk about some of the focus of the Institute and how that relates to the role of the Police and Crime Commissioner, which is where we kind of tie in the how are we making evidence-based policy and practice a reality. Um, and it is quite varied across the country, so I'll try and caveat some of what I talk about um, in that sense. So, before November 2012, we had police authorities that were governing our police forces. So, as I, th as I said, we have 43 areas. Our police authorities were made up of normally about 17 nominated representatives from things like local councillors and magistrates, um, and they had a chairman. So at that time, I think probably less than 1% of the population could have told you the chairperson's name um, or what the role of the police authority was. So our government made a decision to change the way that police forces were governed and the way that pl policing budgets and resources were managed and distributed um, to try and involve the public more and create a bit more democracy around policing. Um, the trouble was that the public didn't really know that there was a problem so then when the government announced this, we're going to make this change, you know, as a solution to this terrible issue that we currently have, um, it was very much perceived as a very costly, bureaucratic nightmare, um, which um, really no communities kind of felt any sort of resonance or relationship with. So it was quite a difficult time because the argument for police and crime commissioners was about better involvement of communities, of diverse communities, of lots of different people having their say around policing. But the turnout for the first elections was really very poor. So in my area, we had 11% of the electorate turnout to vote for our police and crime commissioner. And our area was the best in the country. And that was just because we had another by-election going on at the same time. So people were at the polling stations and said, oh, what's this? OK, fine, I'll tick a box. So arguably, we don't even know how informed some of those people were that were voting. So some of the, some of the challenges around um, the implementation of the role kind of stick with us today because we're, we're, you know, we're constantly challenged by people that still don't really perceive it as a, a very valid role. Um, in terms of what the Police and Crime Commissioner does then, so they hold the Chief Constable to account for delivering policing services. There's very much a focus on efficiency and effectiveness. So there's a big drive at the moment to save a lot of money. A lot of money is being drawn out of the public sector at the moment. Our area alone needs to save 23 million over the next three years. We've already saved about 10. Um, and we've done everything we can to the sort of back office functions around policing. So the next step's going to be very critical and very noticeable to the public. Um, so beyond holding the Chief Constable to account around those kind of areas, they have full responsibility for the policing budget and where those resources go. So at the moment, about 96% of the budget goes straight to the Chief Constable to deliver policing services. Um, the remainder is spent on the and crime bit of the role. So we talk about police and crime commissioners. We have a responsibility for crime prevention, and we call it community safety. Um, which is very broad, so we pay for things like dedicated substance abuse programs um, and kind of youth intervention activity, and we have what we call an innovation fund. I'm not sure if you have something similar here. Um, we have similar things run at a national level, um, but us as a police and crime commission have set aside a bit of the budget to kind of um, push upstream. So how is it that we start to invest um, at the sort of early intervention level talking about you know, young people, youth intervention, um, and working with communities to deliver community safety. Um, beyond managing the budget, um, the, the big role for police and crime commissioners is to communicate well with, with communities. As I've said, the whole reason that they were 
put in place was to talk to people, find out what their policing priorities are, and put the resources where they need to be. So the idea is that they are very visible, they're out there in lots of different communities, they've got an opportunity to build the confidence of some of the communities that are maybe more diverse, our black and minority ethnic communities historically have got lower confidence in policing, much less likely to report crime, much more likely to be victims of crime, much more likely to be um, offenders of certain types of crime. So we know there's a lot we need to do around those relationships. Um, there's also an opportunity for us to change the dialogue with young people so um, they don't have the right to vote um, and they can't, be, um, sorry, up until 18 um, and they couldn't vote for police and crime commissioners until they're 18. So we're looking at how can we get more young people to have a say around policing um, and the way that things like stop and search work where actually young people are more likely to be targeted of that kind of police activity. So how do we start to develop some relationships around that? One of the weaknesses of the police and crime commissioner model in that sense is that I think, so, I'm probably right in saying that about 90% of our commissioners are middle-aged white men. Um, and the system was created by middle-aged white men. So their ability perhaps to represent some of those communities that we're talking about and do this vital part of the role could be challenged. Um, and one of the other challenges is around the future of policing. So we've, you know, two years ago gone through a very expensive change to put in place 43 police and crime commissioners. Um, but at the same time, we're having conversations about how we scale up policing. So we have 43 police forces. Um, our general election next year, if our Labour Party are elected, they want that to become seven police forces. So then how do we look at, you know, keeping this concept of democratic policing that's, you know, um, designed and um, almost delivered in a way that meets communities' needs at a local level, but you have, you could have ten police and crime commissioners directing one chief constable and all of his resources. It does start to get a little bit complex, but not necessarily impossible. So that's just a little bit around police and crime commissioners. I appreciate some of that might be a little bit abstract. Um, so I thought I might just say a couple of things about our agenda in Northamptonshire to try and put some of that um, into context. So we talk about our agenda across four specific areas. So we talk about victims and visibility and prevention and translation. So we talk about translation of evidence into practice. Um, and that's very much linked to our sort of prevention agenda, so how we're starting to take people out of crime. So if I start with visibility, um, we were just talking about it, about it now, around um, the challenges that we have in meeting the public's needs and community's needs, um, but still using resources appropriately and in the best possible way for the best possible outcomes. And sometimes they don't really match up. So um, Northamptonshire has um, a city centre and a couple of other kind of hotspot areas, but largely it's quite a rural area. And in those rural areas, we have communities that very much want to see their policing. Um, but we don't tend to put our policing resources there because the crime is so low. So how is it that we start to um, meet their needs around visibility but don't use the expensive resource of policing, um, you know, but still develop what the Police and Crime Commissioner model was about? So we're looking at what we call special constables, um, which is a a voluntary police officer, essentially. So they get paid their expenses, they are fully trained, they have all the powers that a police officer has, but they do it in their own time. Most of them do about four hours a week, and most of them do it because they want to become police officers, um, but we are starting to get more people in that are actually just interested in giving something back, having some professional skills. Um, quite often it's linked to what they do outside um, or, or at work, so they might be a security officer, and it might be quite helpful for them to have those additional skills. And some of them can then start to um, be a special constable when they're at work. So it's called employer-supported policing. So some of them are using those skills in their own time, but in their workplace and contributing back to their communities that way. So when we came into office two years ago, we had 220 special constables. We've now got 400. And by next summer, we plan to have 900 and we have 1,220 police officers. So we start to really shift the dynamics around what, you know, the relationship between police officers and special constables, but also what do we mean when we talk about policing? Because our policing resource then you know, has, has become huge, 
um, and the responsibilities and roles that, that we include and need to manage and need to maximise the outputs of almost completely change. So our um, management structure within the force needs to change to be able to manage um, voluntary roles, which you know is not something that they've historically done. And the, there'll be questions around um, how do you use your command and control skills in the same way with voluntary roles that you do with paid roles because the drivers for those individuals doing the jobs will be different. So there's quite a lot of measures that we need to look at, and I'll come back onto that when I start talking about the Institute and its role in our reform agenda, um, because a lot of this we need to make sense of. And you know, if I'm being really honest, some of this stuff, we haven't got the evidence to have made the decision in the first place, but we're in a context where we have to save £23 million in three years. We have to do things differently. And if we lose any more confidence in the public, they'll stop reporting crime even more. They stop reporting intelligence. And our ability to police effectively with the resource that we do have becomes diminished. So we're in one of those contexts where we're trying to really catch up with the research and the evaluation and the evidence to support what we're doing, um, which is why we've invested in the Institute. I'll just talk quickly around our victims agenda. So when we first came into office, we undertook a consultation with victims of all sorts of crime. We spoke to over a thousand victims, which um, is not significant. It's, you know, it's not a valid number in terms of, of the rate of crime in Northamptonshire. But we kept it very broad and it was very qualitative and we talked about people's experiences. Um, and it was a really good activity to undertake when we first came into office because it, it enabled us to set the agenda of victims are important here. Um, Historically, you know, we, we've looked at satisfaction measures um, for victims of crime. So we have um, a telephone bureau that survey victims between six weeks and 12 weeks after their offence. And we ask them about what the police did, how they contacted them, you know, how satisfied were they. And we use that data to report back to the Home Office um, to say this is a reflection on how our police force are delivering policing services to victims. Um, for us, that, it just doesn't go far enough. So we want to look at the whole victim experience. Um, and if you start to look at the experience rather than um, specific satisfaction measures, you can start to see that there are different points in that experience um, that almost have nothing to do with some of the services that are delivered. So if you start looking at things like help-seeking behaviours, um, there's a lot of activity that happens and a lot of relationships that are important that actually never interact with the justice process. So arguably, some of the measures that we have around satisfaction start to not mean anything because we don't know the wider context of, of what that victim is receiving outside of those services. So um, we did this massive consultation. We had 79 recommendations come out of that for change, which was significant. And um, only 19 of those recommendations were for the police. So we presented this work and... Um, you know, about a quarter of the recommendations were for our court service and our Crown Prosecution Service and, you know, what are they doing to make sure that they put in place the right special measures for victims when they're going to court to protect them um, from the perpetrator that might be in the same room and are they being given the opportunity to give their vic victim impact statements when they're in court and all of these kinds of issues where the policies say that certain things are happening but victims are telling us that they're not. And that's what became really apparent through that whole piece of work, that a lot of things that we presume are happening aren't, um, and that where we've got policies in place that we think meet victims' needs, they quite often don't. It was ch a challenging time for us, because when we published that report, um, we did have some responses from some agencies saying, it's a brilliant report, it's really good that you're um, consulting with victims, but you're a police and crime commissioner and we're not the police and you don't govern us, so we'll see what we can do. And that was really quite um, difficult because we wanted to bring everybody together to start to challenge some of the um, difficulties that victims are facing. But what we needed to do was start to talk about why that would, um, or why activity in these areas would help some of those agencies in delivering what they need to deliver. So we needed to start to change the conversation and start talking about justice outcomes and how many witnesses actually are turning up to court to achieve the justice that you need to achieve, um, and then trying to work out why is it that some victims don't want to participate in justice processes and court processes, and why is it that we lose witnesses along the way so that 
you know, we block the ability to achieve justice. And once we've started to have some of those conversations, it's really started to change um, the way that we're sort of working together around the victims' agenda. And we've just commissioned a brand new service for victims, which meets about 20 of those recommendations. And we've put quite a lot of money into that. So that's also been quite beneficial in terms of bringing those relationships together. Um, that new service will also be a, a significant part of the new institute's role in terms of evaluation because it's, um, it's changing the way that we communicate with victims, really. So we're looking at much more of a customer relationship management programme. So it's an umbrella service that, that enables victims to access one person, one single point of contact, and that person will manage their relationship with the justice system but also manage their relationship with support services. So what we found in our consultation was that victims were either contacted several times by several different organisations telling their story over and over and over again, or they weren't contacted by anybody and completely missed. And it was particularly prevalent around domestic violence where we have lots of voluntary and charity organisations that are delivering support services, um, but quite often they're only triggered where those victims are high, high risk and it's where they're high risk according to police data, not vulnerability or victim needs. So we started to sort of discover these victims where actually their requirements for support um, to manage things like anxiety, stress and depression um, weren't receiving the support that they needed and that was what was you know, preventing them to have any kind of relationship with policing or with justice. So we needed to rethink how is it that we manage um, or help to manage um, victims going through processes and accessing all the services that they want and need and how do we do that where they haven't reported to the police because we know that we have lots and lots of victims that don't um, and in the UK we've just published the Victims Code of Practice which means that we have a statutory obligation to, to provide support to all victims um, whether they've reported to the police or not and we're looking at putting that into legislation next year so we need to kind of very quickly work out how we start to create something that enables victims to access support without going through the police. So that's why we've commissioned this separate, independent organisation that's able to do that. But in doing so, um, we, we've designed it based on what victims have told us, but we're still working out what the evaluation measures are, because now we're talking about victim recovery and victim experience and not victim satisfaction with one specific service. And we've invested more money than any other area in the country because we wanted to put in place a model that we think will work. So we need to find out whether it works or not. So we're having quite a few challenging conversations in the Institute now about what constitutes victim recovery and how long do you measure it for and what kind of data do you need to be able to do that. Um, and can we go a bit further than just talking to victims about their experiences and what they're telling you? Um, because actually that changes day by day as well. So now we're looking at measures, um, clinical measures of anxiety, depression um, and stress, access to GP surgeries, access to medication for those types of symptoms, how long those medications are being used for, um, any other symptoms that victims might be presenting that they may not actually associate with their victimisation. Um, impact on employment and sickness and education and starting to think much more broadly around what's the, what's the impact overall on victims and victimisation. And then we're hoping to get to a point where we can start to put some costs around it so that then we can start to have different conversations with our health service about why is it that there's a 24-week waiting list for somebody that's just suffered a trauma and they need some therapy? And should it be a police and crime commissioner that's paying for that kind of service, which is about their health needs, their mental health needs, their emotional needs, um, because the system doesn't work? So I've had some really interesting conversations today about how you can start to create some of that economic argument um, to get to the outcome that you need. And the two other areas that we focus on in the Northamptonshire area are around involvement and prevention. So when I talk about involvement, I've kind of mentioned it several times already. This is about how is it that we properly engage with our communities in different and innovative ways and how do we build confidence, how do we encourage people to report crime. Um, and really, how, how do we bring this 
concept of democratic policing based on community needs to life. So we're having to look very differently at how we engage with people. So we've just done um, a consultation with children and young people on online safety. And we've managed to reach 7,000 young people already. Um, we're quite a small area, so that's, that's quite good for us. Um, and it started to stimulate quite a lot of debate in the county about why we're asking all these questions to children and young people and why isn't it the schools that are doing that and kind of, you know, it's, it's quite interesting the kind of dynam dynamics that, that us doing that kind of work creates. Equally, we did a consultation around stop and search. Um, I'm not sure if you use the same phrase here. Um, okay. Um, but that's looking at uh, what young people's experiences are of police officers stopping them in the street and potentially searching them. What do they think has happened? What do they think their rights are? And how could those relationships um, be strong enough to withstand that kind of activity? And, you know, because there's quite a lot of justification that can be put around some of that. Um, we, we were talking earlier around the random um, breath tests and how that's an opportunity because you're having an interaction with somebody. Um, to potentially change the way that they think about the police or justice. So we're looking in a similar way, really, at how we stop and search young people. If that's your interaction with that young person, how do you lead them with something that's much more um, positive, um, despite the activity that you've undertaken? So that kind of involvement activity, I think, is what really brings the Police and Crime Commission a role into its own. Um, and it will be interesting to see how that plays out in future if it, if it does change. Um, and then very briefly on, on prevention, this um, is really about how do we invest money upstream to save longer term. Um, we, we, we've called the work taking a generation out of crime. We're focusing very much on young people and we have set up an office for faith-based and community initiatives which looks at uh, what are the organisations that are out there in the community already doing? Because there's so much diversion activities for young people, um, support services and so on, being delivered in the voluntary and faith sector, uh, probably based on very little information, evidence, or, you know, we don't know whether it works or not, but we know that there's a lot of it going on. So that office is looking at how do we work with those organisations to identify what works, to help them scale up where it does work, um, to find out what it, what, what's the drive and the energy behind that and how do we extend that so that when, when we've worked out what this taking a generation out of crime work looks like, we can start to think very differently about the resource that goes into making that stuff happen because there's a lot of intervention programmes going on um, and we're going to need to draw back on some of those, um, you know, particularly around saving more money, um, but also changing the way that we do things and the way that things are delivered. So everything that I've just said about our agenda, we are trying to underpin it with evidence. But like I said, there was a lot of pressure on us. We had a three and a half year term um, and we need to deliver very quickly. So we did come up with some, some policy ideas pretty quickly uh, and we're putting those into practice now. And I've tried to, tried to reference some of the areas that we're going to do a lot of the research and evaluation in. But as a caveat to all of that, um, we, we decided to invest quite a significant amount of money in the institute that we've set up as a, almost a promise, really, to the sector of we've come up with a lot of innovation here and we've put a lot into practice, but that doesn't mean that we don't know what it means to do a lot of work up front to design services going forward. So we set up the Institute for Public Safety, Crime and Justice, which is very much about that. So starting out with strategic analysis, and evaluation, so really trying to understand problems. Um, so I think some of the examples of the work going on at the moment are around violence um, that's related to alcohol and antisocial behaviour. Um, we're looking at teen domestic abuse. So starting out with very broad scopes of what, what is it we're actually talking about here? What does it look like? What data do we have? What data do we need? Um, what's going on? Because there's a lot, of, a lot of activity going on, particularly around policing in some of those areas, and we don't know whether it works or not. Um, and then more broadly collating some of the national and international data to start us from that position that we need to be to be able to start looking at problem solving and putting in place the right activities to address that. So really, this um, institute is about, uh, I guess, bridging the gap between research and academia and you know, evaluation, policy, and then the practice on the ground. So 
we've made this commitment from a policy um, community, I guess, um, to the research community to create that relationship. Um, and Rick said earlier that I've got a role within the Institute. And so it's, it's a very visible demonstration. I spend two days a week at the Institute and I spend three days a week at the Police and Crime Commission. So I, I am a physical link between research and evidence and policy development. And I lead the policy team in the Commission. So I'm making sure that we're not, um, we're not missing anything. Um, and then the next step of that is how we link that to practice. So we need to make a difference on the ground for all of that initial work up front to actually make a difference. So within the Institute, we have the training um, program for police officers. So all new recruits, all professional development for police officers that's happening, the training for the special constables that I mentioned, that all of that will be happening within the Institute so that we have the opportunity to embed the evidence um, and things like skills around research methods, really high level, but just roughly needing to know whether a research study is robust and valid or, or not. Um, so we still have quite a few officers that will use evidence that's really outdated and, and it's really challenging for them to be able to keep up, but also to make those judgments themselves. So there's an opportunity within the Institute to embed some of those skills, um, just to identify the right types of research that they should be looking at, understanding what, um, what scale of research might be needed for specific work and projects that they might be working on. Um, bringing that all together within the Institute creates a relationship right from day one for those officers of if I want to train to be a police officer, I'm being trained within, within this academic environment. I'm being trained within a space that values evidence and evaluation, that thinks it's really important to know what doesn't work. And if we can start to create a shift in the next generation of police officers where promotion isn't based on a successful intervention but is based on a successfully implemented um, intervention or program, then we can start to change the way that evidence is used within policing on the ground. And I think that's where we need to be. Um, certainly, so we have a college of policing in the UK, which is trying to do that kind of exact role. Um, and they keep saying to us, we don't have um, we don't have people that are criminologists, but also economists and statisticians. And we need a bit more of that to be able to understand some of the complex issues that we're trying to address. So they've kind of made a plea to us of, can you kind of try and create some of those for the future? So we're now looking at how is it that we make connections between our social sciences degree and our institute to try and get some, some students thinking differently about how they apply their skills and look at different social issues. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and maybe developing maths um, students, you know, into the institute to try and apply some of those mathematician skills that they're developing um, into some of the models that, that we've described earlier. Broadly, that's probably an explanation of the institute. I guess a couple of pieces of work that I've referenced throughout the talk so far um, have been around evaluating voice so that's a really important sorry voice is the service that we set up around victims and witnesses and, and providing support to them so that's one of our kind of pioneering areas of how do you measure victim experience differently i mentioned the special constabulary and this you know significant growth in the use of volunteers um, in delivering policing services so the work that the institute's going to do around that is looking uh, how do you properly recruit special constables? How, what, what are the drivers that you need to be able to identify in the types of people that you want to become special, cons um, special um, police constables? But also, how can we address some of the other issues in policing through that work? So we have a diversity agenda. Um, the vast majority of our police officers, again, are white men. Um, and we would like to have a more representative police force of our community. So how is it that we encourage women, black minority ethnic communities into policing? And this is a slightly different way of doing it um, because they're coming in as a volunteer and we're offering to some of those special constables to police only their own area. So it might be, I'm calling them parish constables because some of the areas we call parishes. Um, so it might be that we could get um, an individual from the Somalian community to almost police their own area and start to develop some of those relationships with the young people to present a positive image of, of being a police officer and start to change some of the perceptions that are there. But we want to be able to evaluate what impact creating a special constabulary could have on the diversity agenda 
and how many of those special constables might become paid police officers and, and what are the opportunities over the next 10 years when it looks like our recruitment of police officers is going to be minimal because we've got so much money to take out. So we need to do a bit of a sort of forecast to say, actually, we're not looking at having a representative police force for another 150 years. And that could be reasonable if you look at our opportunities to recruit. Um, so if we're going to set ourselves some targets around, you know, how, how could we start to change the diversity agenda, we need to have some, some realistic information to work with. I just wanted to reference one other piece of work that the Institute's working on. So this is called Frontline Voices. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of been developed off the back of the victims' voice work that I referenced earlier, which talks to victims very broadly about their experiences. When we were doing that work, we started to talk to a lot of the stakeholders that deliver services to victims and started to learn quite a lot about their experiences on the ground and delivering those support services and what, 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 it, what the world looks like to them and what they think needs to happen. And then thought, this would be a really good piece of work if we were talking to police officers, fire officers, paramedics, social services, probation officers, prison guards. If we talk to all of them about their experiences of delivering their roles, we could start to develop our understanding of what service they think they're delivering, what <coughs> job do they think they're doing, what are the drivers in them doing their jobs, what are the barriers to them being able to do their jobs effectively. And the, the, the conversations that we're having around um, scaling up police forces, of bringing police and fire together, bringing ambulance services together, what does that all feel like for the officers that are on the front line delivering these services? And what different ideas could we start to get from them about how we develop some of this going forward? So that's going to be a significant piece of work where we plan to talk to thousands of, of people delivering these services in our county to start to develop our own insight, really, around that and start to develop the policy agenda going forward. And I think it's absolutely right that the Institute is starting that piece of work um, so that we do go from you know, research to policy, development to practice on the ground. But it started with the practitioners, and they understand that cycle, and everybody can start to feel like they're part of one circle of, of improvement, really. So I think that's probably enough from me. Thank you.